Um, yeah, my name is Jonas Pfefferle. Um, I'm from IBM Research. Uh, I, th I think some of you folks have already been um, there on Sunday, uh, yesterday, where I talked a bit about this. This basically is a talk that gives an overview of the NVMe over Fabrics effort uh, in Ceph and what we have been doing in a bit more structured way than yesterday. Um, so feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have questions so we can kind of keep this a bit dynamic. So the first thing is why do we want to do NVMe over fabrics in the first place, right? I mean, we have RBD. Uh, RBD is on top of the uh, RADOS protocol, right? It's, it's, it has, it's reliable. It's actually distributed. Um, and you can directly access your storage. It's sensibly fast, right? So why put another thing in between? Um, like why add another protocol, right? And I think the main reason is we want to be interoperable with the other systems, right? And NVMe over Fabrics is the standard to access remote storage. And um, we also want to enable use cases where you might in your ecosystem already use NVMe over Fabrics with other storage systems, right? So your initiators uh, can easily talk to, to, to Ceph this way. And uh, one other big thing is also, um, you know, when we are talking about NVMe over Fabric, many DPUs have already support for offloading the initiator side, so you can directly plug this in without ha having to try to offload libRBD onto the DPU. Also, uh, uh, someone in first row here from AMD will talk about how to do this tomorrow. <laughs> All right, so it basically looks similar to the RGW gateway in, in some sense, right? Um, so we have, on the one side, we have the NVMe initiator. This is any standard initiator. It could be kernel or SPDK or what have you, right? You talk any of these protocols. We actually only support two. We support TCP and RDMA. Um, and then you have the gateway in between, which just translates from NVMe over Fabric to RADOS, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, how it does that, I will talk about. And then on the other side, you have your Ceph cluster. Right. So. Give you, for those of you who are not super familiar with NVMe, I give you a very short overview, just that we are on the same terms. And, uh, so how it works in NVMe, there's a concept called a subsystem. And a subsystem is basically just a, um, a, a term of grouping uh, and, um, a set of volumes, which are called namespaces. And when an initiator connects to a subsystem, it typically gets its own controller. And the controller is, in the end, responsible for issuing the actual I.O. to a namespace. And we basically bridge then a namespace um, to, to an RBD image, and uh, then it goes to the Ceph cluster. Right? OK, so number one is what we did we created a little Python control daemon, um, which you can do RPCs to, basically to configure the whole NVMe OF gateway, right? And basically what you can do there, um, the commands that we support are in the sort of map this um, RVD image to this subsystem namespace and let it be exposed at this IP port, right? Very simple. Um, and what we also added is, so we use gRPC for that, uh, of course, you can you, you can write your own gRPC client to connect to it, or you can use uh, our CLI um, the, to to set up the the configuration. Now, second thing is you want your configuration obviously to be persistent. You don't want to uh, reissue all these uh, control commands every time you reboot the daemon. So what we do is we store the config actually in Ceph in a form of uh, an object uh, map. So it's in OMAP, um, meaning if you shut it down, you bring it back up, it will reconfigure itself to the state it had before. And I will also talk about how we also use this to do um, basically multiple gateways to have multi-passing. Um, then for the data path, we decided to use SPDK. SPDK is, uh, stands for Storage Platform Development Kit, I believe. It's an open source project by Intel, and it essentially was created to 
access local NVMe drives from user space, but since then has been widely extended and now supports also NVMe over Fabric. And they have a, they have a concept called BDEV, which is block, stands for block device, where they basically can abstract uh, different types of block devices um, can be anything from an RBD image to NVMe to you name it, right? They have a bunch of um, block devices supported. There, well, so the reason why we picked it is the target, of course, already existed, the target site, and the RBD BDEV actually also existed. So it, it was very easy to get this working in the first place. We just extended it, added more features, uh, made it more performance, fixed a few bugs. Um, and essentially how this works, how the whole gateway works is you have this Python um, process, which is our control daemon um, that is there for the whole control path. And it, also, it spawns off this SPDK process and it configures it via RPCs. So if you do an RPC to the control daemon, basically um, does an RPC with the correct command to, to, to SPDK to configure it. And the whole thing here runs in a container, right? And in the future, you will be able to configure the whole thing with, with Ceph ADM, much like you can today with the iSCSI uh, gateway. All right, so one thing is somehow you need to map NVMe operations or NVMe commands to RBD operations. And um, when we started, as I said, the RBD BDEF was already there, but um, only like the basic commands were supported, like read, write. And we added a few more. So we added, for instance, unmap. In, so this is term, this is the NVMe term, it's called unmap, which essentially maps to discard in, in RBD terms. We added flush, we added write zeros. This is something that has been in the work for a while because it needed some changes in, in, in libRBD. Um, so there is actually, for those of you who don't know, in libRBD there's an API to do compare and write um, directly on RBD. Um, the problem was that it was um, kind of arbitrarily restricted to only support 512 bytes um, because of an old use case for, actually it was a VMware use case for the iSCSI gateway, um, which they at that point only needed 512 byte um, support. And we extended this to now work on, theoretically on block, on um, the object size that you choose for, for RBD, which is typically per default four megabyte. Um, there's one more restriction if you use striping, then it can be max stripe size. And you can do compare and writes with. Um, yep, so this, this stuff that we added in libRBD, the only thing that's missing is the part in SPDK. I have the patch already ready. I just have to um, basically submit it and test it. <laughs> it's easy, right? Uh, <laughs> has been laying around for a few months now. Um, but I will come to it eventually. And then a few things that are not supported natively by the libRBD backend, and that's um, compare, for instance. Um, in, I think in theory, um, Rado supports to do compares, but it's just not exported in libRBD, so we could in future support it if it's really um, needed. Uh, for the moment, it's just emulated in SPDK, and what SPDK does is just does a read operation and then it just compares in software in SPDK um, and, and gets the result back. Now there is, so this one is a harder one, that's why it has two stars. Uh, and the, this one I talked about yesterday with, so there's an abort command in, um, in NVMe, which basically as the name suggests, just says abort the the, the command you issued, right? The problem is that there's no such thing in libRBD. Once you issue the command, you basically, you wait until it's completed. Um, what does this mean in terms of what we do? So how SPDK handles this is, if you submitted an IO to, uh, to the gateway and it still somewhere hangs into, in the SPDK code in gateway and you send an abort, uh, it comes in before the command has been issued to libRBD. It will abort it within SPDK. Once it's issued to libRBD, there's nothing we can do about it. We have to wait until it comes back and then basically abort it. Um, 
that's that's how the avoid semantics at the moment work. I don't know if in the future uh, something like this could be implemented on the Ceph side. Uh, I'm not sure if that would be uh, feasible or not, but this is how it works at the moment. Uh, and the last one is copy. This is relatively new NVMe um, command. Um, that's also something that's not supported by libRBD. And um, in theory, you can emulate this in SPDK, but at least for, from my point of view, you, sh you really shouldn't. I mean, it's, it's there, it's in the code base, it's supported, but I wouldn't use it because this, is, this gives you really unpredictable performance on the gateway side, right? Once you offload big operations like this onto the gateway, it's basically hocks your CPU with copying stuff around that you would otherwise use for other operations. And you cannot really Q QS that at the moment in SPDK, so I rather would not uh, use it. Right, okay, let's talk about um, gateway groups and multipathing. So obviously, as soon as you want to go uh, use this in the enterprise setting, something sensible, you need to be able to support failures, right? Um, <coughs> that being failures on the network or actually gateway going down or the, the server going down where the gateway runs on or, or you name it, right? And how do we solve this? There is a, in NVMe over Fabric, there is a, um, Multipathing is part of the specification, um, and basically what you, what it what the spec says, you basically span a subsystem um, over multiple targets, and then you have multiple paths to connect to a um, subsystem. And you see here how we do this is okay. We span between gateways, and the span we call a gateway group. This is basically your fault uh, uh, tolerance domain. Uh, and this is freely configurable. You can decide how many gateways uh, you want to have. And all the gateways within a gateway group, they share the same configuration. Um, so if you basically, from a point of view from setting this up, you once set up how many gateways you want in a group, and then you say create mapping of this RVD image to um, this subsystem, and then all the gateways in the group will automatically configure uh, to actually expose this um, particular subsystem and namespace. Uh, as you see here, they point to the same RVD image in the back. Um, then this is an addition to the spec, um, which is called asymmetric, asymmetric namespace access, which is essentially just a way to control to which gateway or to which target you want to uh, have your uh, traffic go to. And there's like, I think, five different states or so they can be in. The two main ones are a and optimized and non-optimized, which basically means the optimized one is the preferred path. So typically that means you are, for instance, for the kernel initiator, if it sees an optimized path, it will pick it and issue all the IOs through the optimized path, right? Um, as soon as the optimized path goes away, it picks any of the non-optimized paths that are around uh, until there's a, a another a path advertised as optimized and it switches to the one that is optimized. If there's multiple optimized paths, depending on your implementation, it will do round robin or only use one, right? That's not defined in the spec, that's how it works. And only because it's not optimized doesn't mean that the path cannot be used. So in theory, the initiator can decide to do IO to the non-optimized path with the star star that it will not get optimal performance typically of the, out of the non-optimized bus. Um, right, and the, how we do this, uh, that they share the same configuration, as I told you before, we store the configuration in Ceph, in OMAP, and we just let them basically read the same OMAP, uh, OMAP um, from, from this uh, object, and we use the watch notify mechanism in Ceph to let them know if one of it changes. And I, I, I told you before, we have this RPC uh, client that you can actually set up the, um, the configuration and you can do RPC requests to any of a gateway in a group and it will change the configuration for the whole group, right? Since the configuration is shared, uh, that also means um, if a gateway is down, you don't lose the ability to actually control uh, the configuration, you can always do this by just choosing any of them and changing the configuration. 
So yeah, we do use watch notify and as a secondary mechanism, if watch notify fails, for instance, you configure the node and before it could uh, actually issue a notify, it crashed or something happened, right? And these scenarios can happen. Then there's a second mechanism which um, actually pulls on the, um, on the OMAP and uh, sees we have a versioning scheme and sees basically that the version change. And uh, there's a third thing that we do is we, we use compare and write to actually update the OMAP. And if the, if the version, we always compare on the version, right? And if the version is not correct, the first thing we do is we load the new version and then we try again to update the config, right? That's essentially the, the scheme. So that means our gateways don't have to talk to each other. Um, everything is synchronized through the, uh, through the OMAP. All right, and of course, uh, if you have multipathing, not this not only help for <coughs> fault tolerance, but you can also, of course, use this to do load balancing and scaling. Right, uh, you can just have many many gateways in a group, um, and let um, initiators connect either to all of them or only to some of them, and basically steer the traffic um, this way to 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 get some some load balancing when you do NVMe or app. Okay, so let's talk about some performance numbers. And basically the goal is, as always, you want to come as close as possible to a non-gateway um, solution. And what we do is, uh, first one I'm, I'm showing here is, um, we compare two configurations. One where we just have a host running libRBD. Um, and then we have the host that runs NVMeOF. Um, an NVMe initiator with the Ceph gateway and the Ceph cluster, right? So these are the two basic configurations. And uh, you see here on the left side is where we started. So this was quite some performance difference uh, between the libRBD directly accessing and the gateway. And this is where we are at, um, at least in our small test cluster that we tested this on. And um, this was just basically a single client doing IO. We extended this a bit um, to do more testing on like more a single client, single volume. And this is kind of a volume scaling test that we just recently done. Um, this test between 100, so basically it's again only one gateway, but um, in this case we have multiple clients and we tested 128 volumes, 256 and 400 volumes. And what we do is 16K IOPS um, with a total queued of 1,024. Um, and in SPDK, we use 16 cores for the, for the reactor, so basically for NVMe processing. And then what you see here is um, we have a possibility in SPDK to use basically um, um, Ceph. We can spawn multiple Ceph clients because a single Ceph client often doesn't give the best performance. Um, so we get more parallelism out of Ceph if we run multiple of those. And this is just a test we did. This 100 gigabit is the, uh, is the NIC that we used here. So we, you see that um, here we come within 74 to 85 gigabits somewhere with a single gateway, which I would say is not bad considering that this is basically going um, you have you have networking here, you have networking here, right? You have some overhead from TCP, you have some overhead from uh, the messenger protocol and so on, right? So um, at least from my point of view, this is basically 400 volumes, each of them hammering IO to the gateway. I think um, this doesn't look too bad. But of course, we are always in the process of improving <laughs> this and, and trying to run it at larger scales and more volumes, right? And by the way, only because we have 400 here doesn't mean we couldn't support more. Uh, so you, you cannot easily run the gateway with like, let's say 2000 volumes. Um, this was just a number we found that if 400 volumes you do per concurrent IO2, afterwards it tries to dip off a bit. Uh, this is something we are investigating why this is the case, right? Um, but yeah, you can have more volumes and 
typically you don't do IO to all the volumes at the same time, right? No, that's typically not the case. Okay, let's talk about uh, what we planned and what we want to do in the future. So the first thing I think that's very important is, uh, this is also a standard NVMe feature, is discovery. And uh, discovery, how it works in NVMe is essentially, instead of someone telling you what the path is to connect to your NVMe or F targets, um, you, um, you talk to a discovery service and the discovery t service will tell you, will give you back a, a log page, it's called in NVMe. And this log page says, these subsystem exist and these are the paths how you can access these uh, subsystems. It uh, doesn't tell you anything about individual volumes, it just gives you access to particular subsystems uh, or paths for that matter, right? And this is how we envision it. Essentially, we use the same mechanism as before since we already had that. Um, we, we read from the OMAP, we use the same, um, or we plan to use the same watch notify and polling mechanism to stay up to date. And then whenever, whenever the configuration changes, the discovery service will advertise um, the new path to, um, to the initiator that connected to it. Um, so currently there's um, a team from Intel working on this and they told me a few days ago that they are 50% done. Uh, whatever that means, right? Uh, but 50% is good, I think. <laughs> we are halfway there. Um, so if some initial plans was to implement the whole discovery service in SPDK, but um, for various reasons, um, I think we decided to basically not do that. And now the plan, they, they are working on a Python implementation for the discovery service. Um, basically written from scratch. Since the discovery service really only has two main things it needs to do. It needs to serve one NVMe command. Uh, well, okay, first you need to support the connect and so on, but it's one main command after you established everything that's the get log page command to, give, to get back this discovery page. And then the second one is you want to be able to send um, asynchronous notifications. So if, if a path changes, this mechanism allows you to update a client on any path changes. If a path goes away or a new path was added, uh, that basically sends a, a message to the initiator saying, hey, there was a path change, uh, update your path, right? Right, that's, that's where we add in terms of discovery. There's also one thing eventually I think we want to add is currently um, this is a, so-called, in NVMe spec terms, a direct uh, discovery service. It's called a DDC. Um, in the future, we also want to have um, central discovery service, which basically would mean you could support running um, multiple Ceph clusters. Um, each of them have a bunch of gateways, and you have one discovery service which serves all of these gateways of your, let's say, multi-site uh, um, deployment. Okay, then authentication and encryption, obviously also a big topic. Um, it's kind of needed as soon as you run anywhere enterprise. Um, so there is something in the NVMe spec which is called NVMe in-band in authentication. We, currently this is not supported by any of the initiators or target implementations out there, at least to my knowledge. Like there's no code in SPDK to support this. There's nothing in the kernel to support this. Um, so for now, we opted to um, make a more simple scheme in the form of having using, using IPsec to have on-wire encryption and basically set it up in a way that you can restrict for an IP port pair to have a particular SA. So since a subsystem is kind of bound to its own listener, in a way, you get authentication to a particular subsystem if via this SA you can only access that particular port, right? It's, it's not exactly the same since it's in the end not NVMe credentials you're authenticating to, you are just authenticating against an IP port, um, but, but it's definitely better than nothing. <laughs> uh, right, in the future, we definitely plan to also have N NVMe inband authentication. Okay, then 
one other big topic, again, a feature that is typically asked for as soon as you are more, want to use this more seriously is uh, doing QoS. And actually, this high-level point, this is, very, this is easy for us to implement because it's already supported in SBDK. If you look closer, it's actually, yeah, there are some caveats. So what we can do is we can, we can support per volume QoS in terms of iOS per second, megabytes, read and write. You can actually differentiate in SBDK. Um, that's already there, but what it means in a in a um, in a multi in a in a gateway group scenario, multi gateway scenario, right? Um, this QoS is done here at this point, right, in the BDEF layer. But if you have multiple paths to your um, to your to your gateways, right, and they all issue IOS, then uh, this is not globally enforced. It's only enforced at one gateway, right? Let's say your IO limit at one gateway, is f you configured it to be 50K, and an uh, initiator decides to use both paths A and B, then in theory, you could do 100K IOPS, I right? Um, so, and currently we don't have a plan yet to implement QS across multiple gateways, because we think, Typically, how people would run this is that if you, you, you use ANA and choose an optimized path and only do IO through an optimized path, and then this whole thing works, right? Um, because as soon as you do something like this, you need to basically have some form of communication, and that's happening on the IO path, in quote unquote, right? Uh, that's not trivial to implement and um, might come with some other caveats. Um, and currently, there's nothing that we could push this to to the Ceph side either. So this is something we have to look at in the future. Right, and the last thing is, people always come to me and say, okay, why not natively let, let Ceph talk NVMe over Fabry? Let an OSD directly talk NVMe over F, right? Uh, why can't we do that? Well. The, the problem is that fundamentally, right, how NVMe over Fabric works is it's a point-to-point -point protocol. And um, how Ceph works is that it's a distributed storage system. A single client talks to multiple, that like your information is sharded across multiple OSDs, right? And the client knows through the crush map to which OSD to go to to actually get the data. Concept like this doesn't exist in NVMe. If you have you can have multiple paths, uh, but it's always assumed that behind each path, you can access the full uh, content of your volume, right? That's why um, some folks at Intel actually started this um, and said, why not extend NVMe to actually also have some sort of knowledge of where the data lies in a multi-path scenario, right? And they want to actually add this to the NVMe standard, and they want to have a way to, um, to push information about information, information where particular data lies to the client side, or have the client run something like a crush algorithm to figure out where the, where the client, uh, sorry, where the data is. And how they envision that they do this is that they want to do this lazily. And the idea is that even if you choose the wrong node because your metadata was not super up to date, you still can have these kind of uh, connections through the back end and then you fetch the actual data from there. But that means that you don't have to like kind of sync the metadata, be up to date all the time, right? It gives you a performance advantage in, in that cell. And, and the basic idea is then you have, you co-locate a gateway with each OSD um, and then if in let's say 99% of the cases, if your crush map is up to date, you land at the correct gateway and only do local uh, access to, to your OSD. And in the rare case where your metadata was stale, you have to basically go and um, go to the other OSDs and fetch the data from there and then give it back. So this is something um, they are working on. They have a few sessions in the NVMe. Um, uh, standardization committee to kind of get this in um, just for you to be aware. Right, so what's the current status? The current status is um, we plan to have an initial version of Ceph MVMEOF MVME in Reef and 
that will be a single gateway without a grouping concept, which will have this uh, uh, the CLI and uh, the gRPC control. We will have safe restore of configuration will be there. And the, the rest we will slowly be adding later. Um, the multi-gateway stuff is already upstream in the repo, and I will, sh I will have a slide on, on the repo in a second. Um, and then future, we will have um, Ceph ADM integration is worked on. Ceph dashboard integration, I think, was already mentioned today uh, by Josh, is being worked on. Uh, again, what I said before, identification encryption, QoS. We also need to work on monitoring. Um, and lastly, the ADNN stuff, which is the kind of optimizing the, the data path, um, is also something we have uh, in the future. So, of course, um, I'm just here to present the work, but there's many, many people behind it, right? And, and many different companies that are interested in it. And so, so just to give you a, a list, I hope I didn't forget anyone. And um, here's the repo. As I said, you can check this out. It already contains the multi-gateway uh, stuff. And so you can download this today and try it. Uh, and let us know, right? Just don't use it in production yet. <laughs> um, um, because testing, of course, is also a big thing uh, we need to heavily invest uh, on. And um, of course, feel free. There's a, there's a weekly meeting every Tuesday. Feel free to just drop in if you want to know what the status is, what's going on in terms of development. There's also an NVMe Slack channel in the Ceph Slack. Uh, you, feel free to ask questions or if you have trouble setting it up or uh, whatever you have, just uh, let us know. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks. Um, I see a lot of similarities with the iSCSI gateway. Yes. <laughs> um, what were the lessons learned from iSCSI Gateway that you did not want in this project? That's a good question. <laughs> um, so, yeah, basically most of the stuff, I think, came through through Ilya, who's one of the, you know, you probably know him all. He's one of the main guys who works on libRBD. Um, so he has been guiding us a bit in not making the same, in quote unquote, mistakes, right? Or lessons learned from, from iSCSI. Uh, so for instance, um, how we store the configuration uh, before in iSCSI, for instance, configuration was stored in the object itself as a JSON. And then when the configuration was changed, they actually was re were reading the whole object. Um, extracting the whole chase and changing something and writing it all back, locking the whole thing while it was going on, right? And and we said, look, if we have like tons of gateways in a group and you do a change, we cannot, if you do configuration changes often, that might become an actual issue in terms of scalability. Also, if your configuration gets large, right, you cannot always uh, read the whole configuration, write it back, it's rather inefficient. So we opted for uh, using OMAP, where we can actually say, hey, just change this key uh, with the compare and write. That was, for instance, one, one lesson learned from, from iSCAS. So you did some communication between JSON yeah, and Yeah. So del we deliberately decided to, if possible, to not let the gateways talk to each other because yeah, so there is in, in iSCSI, actually, it's a huge thing, right? They basically have their own consensus protocol implemented between the uh, gateway nodes. And um, I would not recommend for anyone to implement their own consensus protocol <laughs> um, because you, there will be bugs, right? Um, and we thought in the beginning about using, like, I don't know, something like Zookeeper or something in that extent that has some form of consensus, but in the end we decided, hey, why not use Ceph to do most of the work for us and try to build a solution that doesn't actually, like make it as simple as possible, right? Um, not have them communicate with each other. If we can get away with it, that's the, at least in our mind, the best possible solution. Any other questions, comments? Or 
back every week, or does it have to uh, be always three weeks like the American League after you have to be every other week? No, 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 no. So, it's, okay, so in that sense, you know, what, whatever, uh, whatever happens on the Ceph side, we don't care about, right? Can be anything. As long as you have a Ceph soft cluster there, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sure. Is there a sensible amount of gateways that you can uh, use? It's like um, <laughs> well, I mean, like in the in the legacy storage, in the, if you have um, one initiator talking to uh, sixteen targets or so, it's going to be a huge problem. Yes, because everything is going to just die at some point. Right. So. Yeah, so if you have lots of gateways connections, it always becomes an issue, right? Because I think in general, NVMe is very heavy on connections. Um, so how it works is actually that as, um, if you have an, a subsystem, is basically the entity you can connect to. And if you have multiple subsystems, you need to connect to any subsystem, right? And on top of this is that for every queue you create, you need one connection. So there is typically an admin queue, which you first initiate when you connect, and then you need at least one IO queue to do IO through. So we have at least two connections per subsystem per initiator, right? And if you want more IO queues, uh, just to give you an example, what the Linux kernel does is it creates an IO queue for every core that's in the system. <laughs> so you get tons of connections. Now you can limit this. Um, you can basically tell the target to tell the initiator to only allow three connections. Uh, and then it, it will reduce that, right? Um, but of course, um, coming back to your questions, how many? I mean, that depends a bit on, on like, you know, configuration, again, how many subsystems you will create, um, how many initiators you will have, how many uh, gateways in a group, because obviously when you do multipassing, um, you typically connect to all of them, right? And then, of course, a gateway also needs resources, right? This is not for free. <laughs> uh, it's actually quite heavy, right, to translate, especially if we're talking 100 or 200 gigabit or more. Uh, you need quite some CPU power to, to push this through, especially if we're talking NVMe over TCP. Any other questions? Yeah. Ah. Um, uh, uh, could you uh, share uh, specific uh, user cases uh, of MVMe Fabric? Uh, especially, we have an internally maintained RBD service and MVMe Fabric service. Our MVMe Fabric service uh, is composed of low-level MVME devices with our CFFS. Uh, many of our customers, uh, the reason uh, why uh, our customers uh, uh, use MVME fabric service because of uh, high performance. Mm. So uh, I think uh, why do you provide uh, the, this uh, gateway uh, really interested view overhead? So any... Um, can you, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a good point, right? You have to understand that typically, right, how it's, how NVMe OF, probably what you are talking about, you typically have some appliance, like a flash system or something like that, that talks NVMe over fabric, and then you get like, I don't know, uh, 50 or less microsecond, maybe even lower uh, to, to your NVMe device, right? Um, obviously, you cannot do this here, but you have to understand, right? We are giving something um, in um, back in the terms of you have a full software-defined storage system in the back, right? That's fully configurable. You can over-provision all these kind of features, right? Uh, you can you can scale it really large, right? Um, and and there you might you might not want to use libRBD to the or or RBD. Um, from what I mentioned before, you want interoperability, you want to be able to use a DPU, or you want to uh, not have, like, not run the full 
code base of libRBD on the client, the NVMe initiate is much smaller in terms of code size. Uh, there might be a multitude of reasons why you choose to run uh, a standardized protocol instead of running RBD, right? And this allows you to basically bridge to it. And of course, we are always working on performance, right? But I don't think we will ever get to like, you know, this raw, raw performance of just talking to one NVMe device somewhere over the network. Uh, again, because you have this whole, you get something um, as in exchange for it, right? Right. Um, but work that's been done, do you guys have any idea about how much extra latency that could kind of reduce overall, or is that not, is it not far enough along to have a say in whether or not it reduces considerably compared to actually the case that, like, um, like an iSCSI or whatever is still more similar to a native client? Right. Um, you know, it's, it's not only a latency game, it's also you have to also provision the network in terms of throughput between, like if you talk to all OSDs, right, you need to, there's lots of traffic happening um, between the node and that means also for, for the latency part, you introduce a lot of chitter, right? If you have them talking to all of them, which of course, if you only talk locally here, um, you, you can avoid this kind of overhead, right? In terms of pure latency, to be honest, I don't think it, you will get much out of it. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, let, let that be 50 microseconds. Yeah. Um, you know, no, in no. the grand scheme, that's, that's not a lot, right? If let's say your typical read is like 500 microsecond to a millisecond or something like that. Um, but it might become more relevant in the future if we are going crimson, right? C store. Um, if we generally get the latency down, then this is this extra hop becomes more of an issue. But I would say the main benefit is that not talking to all the ones and not having this kind of inter-cluster communication happening all the time. Um, so actually, we we have been so uh, yeah we have been focusing focusing more. And if you Google my name and Open Fabric, you will also find an old talk from me, uh, which talks more about the client side, so initiator side uh, offloading. So what we've tested in the past is basically running an offloaded NVMe initiator on the client side, um, and it in terms of performance. To be honest, it's not a big difference. It's mostly features that you get, right? Like t in terms of isolation and these kind of things towards your, your host, right? If you run this in a cloud scenario, uh, you can basically present the local NVMe device to your host uh, or something that looks like a local NVMe device, but in reality, it runs Ceph behind it, right? Uh, so this, this stuff that we tested. Yeah. And by the way, this is how the work initially started. We actually tried to run the Ceph, we tried to run libRBD on a SmartNIC, <laughs> and the SmartNIC only had a few ARM cores, and turned out that the performance was pretty poor because actually libRBD is pretty heavy to run. But they had NVMe over fabric offloading, and then we just put SPDK in the middle, and we actually figured out that we can stay within, I don't know, 10% of the performance of, um, of running libRBD native. So, this kind of is how the whole work started. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.